Hello students, there are different approaches to understand the personality of an individual. We know that psychoanalytic approach and behavioristic approach, how they have come out with the assumptions with regard to the development of personality. Psychoanalytic focused on the childhood experiences and how the life instincts play an important role in the formation of the personality and how it influences the development. Similarly, the behavioristic approach focused on the environmental experiences and the modeling, the shaping and other various factors which shape the personality of an individual. But humanists believed that all these approaches may not be really trying to explain, trying to provide required information with regard to the development of the personality. So as a reaction against the psychoanalytic approach and the behavioristic approach, humanistic approach came out with a different perspective with regard to the development of personality of an individual. The main assumptions of the humanistic approach are, the present has to be given importance. Unlike psychoanalytic approach which has given importance to the past or instead of giving importance to the future which is uncertain, humanists believe the present that is here and now experiences play an important role. If we can understand the here and now experiences of an individual, it will help us in understanding the behavior of an individual. The second assumption is humanistic approach is based on reality. They believe that people should accept responsibility for their behavior, for their decisions and for their life. They feel that every individual has a right, has a will and has a freedom to take their own decisions. So they cannot blame others or the situations or they cannot blame the instincts for their behaviors. This is the second assumption. The third assumption of the humanistic approach is human beings by virtue of being a human possess inherent worth. All individuals may not behave always in a positive way but it doesn't mean that they do not possess the self-worth. So even though they sometimes engage in negative actions, we have to take into consideration that individuals do possess self-worth. The fourth assumption is the goal of life should be to achieve personal growth and understanding. This is possible only when you are developing an understanding of yourself and when you are making an effort in order to develop. Based on these assumptions, humanists developed a perspective in understanding the personality of an individual. Two pioneers in the field of humanistic approach were Abraham Maslow and Carl Rogers. With their own concepts, they tried to present the personality of an individual in a positive side and also explain what are the various factors that influence the development of the personality. Now let us discuss Hierarchy of needs given by Abraham Maslow. Hierarchy of needs was one of the interesting concepts given by Abraham Maslow which has influenced different fields. It is not just the psychology but even in the field of economics or even in the field of sociology, in the field of medicine, this concept of hierarchy of needs has been used by different researchers and different professionals in order to understand, in order to explain the well-being of an individual. Now what is this hierarchy of needs? The basic premise behind this hierarchy of needs is we are born with certain basic needs. Unless these basic needs are met, we cannot go forward in the life. So all these needs are presented in the form of an hierarchy. At the basic level, the initial needs are propounded once these needs are met, the higher level needs will be satisfied. So in this particular view, the pyramid indicates the first level needs are the physiological needs. Maslow believes that these basic needs, which are called physiological needs, these are very important for the survival. Without satisfying these needs, if you are going to develop in the hierarchy, it is difficult to sustain or keep ourselves in that particular ladder. So physiological needs like food, clothing, water, oxygen, these are very much essential for survival. Once these needs are met, we will think of the second level needs 
called as need for safety and security. Once the basic needs are met, we strive to think of getting the security from the people around and also we try to see ourselves a place in the world where we can be free from any harm. So, in order to get the feeling of this safety and security, we try to get the support of the people around us. These are called second level needs. Once the safety and security needs are met, we think of third level needs and these are called need for love and belonging. It is not just sufficient if we have just the physiological needs met and the safety and security needs. Naturally, we have to think of love and affection. We want to be loved, we want to be accepted by the people around, by the family, by the friends. It is not only getting the attention, love and affection from others, we also want to share the same feelings towards the others. So, these needs are given importance now once the lower level needs are met. So, here at this level, once the feelings of love and affection were fulfilled, the person thinks of the next level needs called esteem needs. Self-esteem needs refers to how the individual feels about himself, the kind of the respect that he feels about himself, the kind of the respect that he wants from the others and he wants a place in the world that he is fit into the world and that he is accepted and he is regarded by the people around. At this time, he also thinks of moving up in the career, wants to accomplish certain standards which he has set and wants to fulfill whatever he wants to in the life. Once these esteem needs are met, the next level needs are self-actualization needs. Self-actualization is the highest level need. It is very difficult to reach towards this particular level. Sometimes few people reach this particular level but they may not be able to sustain themselves there. So, very few people will be self-actualized. Now, what is this concept of self-actualization? Self-actualization refers to understanding oneself. It is not just the superficial understanding, but the basic deep understanding of oneself. At this stage, the person tries to explore himself, his emotions, his feelings and does not want to hide anything from his own perception. He accepts himself from what he is, how he is behaving. And at this level, he tries to use maximum of his energies for the benefit of the society rather than using his inner potentials for his own benefit. So, at this level, he accepts the people around without having any negativity or any hatred towards the people. Even if he has, he just accepts and analyzes the things. So, there is a deep understanding of oneself at this level and maximum energies he will be utilizing for the benefit of the society rather than for one's own benefit. So, very few people have reached this self-actualization. And psychologists mention some of the historical figures as self-actualizers. If you take India, Mother Teresa, Mahatma Gandhi were considered as self-actualizers. Of course, Swami Vivekananda too, who have used their inner capacities and potentialities to create awareness among the people on various aspects and to educate them on different aspects, on various facets of the life, providing them certain knowledge regarding various aspects. Similarly, if you look ab abroad, Abraham Lincoln, Edison, Jefferson were considered as some of the examples for self-actualizers. Originally, when Maslow proposed the hierarchy of needs, these are the different stages. But later on, he extended other needs like cognitive needs and aesthetic needs immediately after the esteem needs. And similarly, he added one more step after the self-actualization that is transcendence. However, the originally proposed hierarchy of needs was much popular among the professionals and the students of the psychology rather than the extended model. Now, let us see what are the characteristics of self-actualizers. When we say very few people master the concept of self-actualization, very few people reach this hierarchy, reach this stage of the hierarchy, let us see what are the characteristics. 
The first characteristic is awareness and acceptance of themselves. Another characteristic of self-actualizers is openness and spontaneity. The third characteristic is the ability to enjoy work and see work as a mission to fulfill. Similarly, self-actualizers also have the ability to develop close friendships without being overly dependent on other people. They possess a good sense of humor. Self-actualizers have the tendency to have peak experiences that are spiritually or emotionally satisfying. These are some of the characteristics of self-actualizers. Everyone can strive to reach this particular stage. Everyone can master it. It all depends upon the effort that is made by an individual. But unfortunately, very few people have the capacity to reach this particular stage. And one more, another feature of this hierarchy is, there is no guarantee that if basic level needs are met and if we are moving forward in the hierarchy, we will be able to move further. At any point of the time, we may move from one particular level to the downwards. That is, instead of going from esteem needs towards self-actualization, we may move downwards from esteem needs to the physiological needs. It may happen because of the circumstances, because of the personality factors. So, Maslow classified these needs, these hierarchy of needs into two types. G needs, that is growth needs and D needs, that is deprived needs. If you are moving ahead from one level to the other, we can say we are in search of G needs. When we move downwards from one level to the other, that we call it as D needs, that is deprivation needs. So this concept of hierarchy helps us to analyze at any point of time in the life where we are, what is that we can do to move forward or why we have sustained for a longer time only at one particular stage but we are not moving ahead. So this analysis helps us to think over and deal with the life situations to move forward in the hierarchy. This is called hierarchy of needs which helps us to understand the personality of an individual. Influenced by Abraham Maslow, Carl Rogers also proposed self-theory in understanding the personality of an individual. Central to the development of personality of an individual is the concept of self. What is this self? Like some people referred self to the soul, some opined that self is nothing but it is mind. However, Rogers defines self in the following way. Self-concept is defined as the organized, consistent set of perceptions and beliefs about oneself. Rogers believed that individuals are aware of their self-concept. The self-concept can be positive, the self-concept can be negative, the self-concept can be high, the self-concept can be low. Which level of self-concept we have formed that depends upon once again the childhood experiences. So what sort of self-concept we have formed that depends upon the formation of experiences and how we are interpreting these experiences. That is, experiences and evaluations of the experiences play a vital role in forming our own self-concept. Self-concept is unique to each individual because experiences of the individual differ. There are different components of the self-concept. The first component of self-concept is self-esteem or self-worth. It refers to the evaluations which we have about ourselves. Are we considering ourselves as successful or are we considering ourselves as failure? So what sort of a self-esteem we formed depends upon our own perceptions towards our achievements. Self-esteem sometimes is also influenced by how we are evaluated by the people around in our interactions with them, especially interactions with the parents, significant others and society at large will also influence in evaluating positively or negatively. The second concept of self-concept is self-image. How you view yourself as an individual? This self-image especially focused on the body image of an individual. So the body image of an individual also 
influences the psychological health. Suppose if an individual feels that he has a good self image that is he looks handsome or she looks beautiful naturally that influences in the formation of a healthy personality like feeling confident, feeling esteemed, feeling worth. But suppose if the person feels that he is not handsome or that she is not beautiful naturally that may influence the personality of the individual also. The way they look at themselves will be influenced. Another component of self concept is ideal self. Ideal self refers to what we would like to be, how we want to be. Every individual has some image of how, where he wants to achieve, how he wants to look. In reality, we may be different, but every individual strives to reach that ideal self. So these are the different components which influence the formation of our self concept. So, Rogers believed there are basically two selves like real self and ideal self. Real self is influenced by our self esteem, our self image and our self worth. Ideal self is what we would like to be. If there is compatibility between what we are and how we want to be, naturally the personality of an individual will be in a healthy manner. That is the personality is developing in a productive way, in an organized way. But suppose like if the difference between ideal self and real self is very large, if there is a large discrepancy, naturally the personality will be shattered. So we have to see that there is not much gap between ideal self and the real self. In order to make the people understand the concept between or the discrepancies between the ideal self and real self, he used the terms congruence and incongruence. Congruence is nothing but how we want to be and how we are. If there is a close relation that is called congruence, there is not much gap, there is not much discrepancy. And this depends upon what sort of positive experiences we have. Suppose like if the child wants to be a good student, if the child wants to be liked by all, but unfortunately in reality the child is not doing well in the academics or the child is not moving positively with the people around, naturally people may not like him. So that creates a discrepancy between how he wants to be and how he is that may result into the incongruence. Suppose like if the child is accepted by the all, if the child is doing well in the academics and that is how he wants to be, naturally it is a state of congruence. There is no mismatch between how he wants to be and how he is. So these two concepts congruence and incongruence will influence our personality in a positive way or in a negative way. Rogers believes that to enhance the congruence in the personality, it is important that the child is given an unconditional love. Unconditional love is accepting the child for what he is, but unfortunately how many parents are providing this unconditional love in this present context? We are trying to bring the child in a more conditional way. For example, we tell the child, you are the best child if you are able to get good grade, if you are able to get good rank. Similarly, we may say, I like you only if you are a topper in the class. So these kind of the conditions may influence the child's personality development. If the child has the capacity, if the child is able to meet the expectations of the parents, naturally there is no problem in the formation of the personality. But suppose if the child's potential, if the child's capacity is limited and if the parents expectations are unrealistic, naturally the child will be suffering with the incongruence that has developed in him. That is, he wants to satisfy the parental expectations, but in reality it is not possible and that is leading to the incongruence which may shatter the personality if the incongruence has developed to a great extent. So Rogers says when we are bringing up the child it is necessary that unconditional love has to be given instead of masturbation. Masturbation means bringing the child under must conditions. You must do this, you must do that. Only then I like you, only then you are a best child. So this masturbation will disturb the child's formation of the personality. Look at this slide. This slide shows congruence and incongruence. 
The two circles under the incongruence indicate the self image that is the real self and the ideal self. As both are not converging, as there is difference between the self image and the ideal self, there is not much of convergence in the circles. There is only a little overlap. As a result, there is much discrepancy in the ideal self and the real self and this may influence the personality development. People who are with this incongruent state, they cannot reach the self-actualization state as it would be difficult for them to build up the gap between the ideal self and the real self. If you look at the congruent figure where you see the ideal self and the real self overlapping, there is much overlap between the two things. Naturally, this indicates that there is congruence between what they want to be and how they want to be. Naturally, this will help the person to reach a stage of self-actualization. Naturally, these two concepts help us to understand whether we are forming a productive personality, a healthy personality or a disorganized and shattered personalities. Rogers believed that a child has two basic needs. One is self-worth and the other is unconditional positive regard. Self-worth we already discussed right now. It is nothing but the esteem which we have about ourselves, the evaluation which we have about ourselves and this self-esteem depends upon our socialization with the others, what sort of experiences we have from the people around, especially from the parents and the significant others. This unconditional positive regard is related to the unconditional love which we have just discussed. So accepting the person for what he is, that is the most important aspect to make the person, to make the child grow in a healthy manner. So when you provide the unconditional positive regard, the child will be blossomed like a flower. But unfortunately, if we are bringing the child under the different conditions, there will be a state of incongruence. So Rogers believes, provide the child with unconditional positive regard and self-worth, definitely there will be a productive personality of a child rather than a shattered personality. However, we can say that self-worth is not stable, it is very dynamic. It may range from one level to the other level. That is, one extreme it is very low, the other extreme it is very high. As the life experiences change, the self-worth of an individual will also be subjected to change. So we have to analyze our experiences if we are feeling low of our self-esteem. What sort of experiences is affecting our self-esteem? So this self-worth will also help us to perceive where we stand, what is that we have to encounter in the life, is there anything that we have to change in our personality. People with high self-esteem will be confident, will be able to accept the life as it is and will also be able to handle in a more efficient manner. On the other hand, people with low self-esteem will be frustrated, will be disappointed easily and they are not ready to take any challenging decisions or risky decisions. Carl Rogers also propounded the concept of self-actualization like Maslow. But he associated the concept of self-actualization to another concept called fully functioning person. Rogers also believes that everyone is capable of being self-actualized, but very few people will be known as fully functioning individuals. The reason is being fully functioning is not a end. It is a process, it is an ongoing journey. So we have to strive throughout the life to be a fully functioning individual. A person who can be claimed as fully functioning individual will have the following characteristics. The first characteristic is openness to experience. That is, they are ready to accept whatever the life situations are without regretting about the past, without worrying about the future. They do not want to analyze as positive or negative. The second characteristic is existence in life. Existence in life is accepting the situations as and when they are arriving rather than brooding over their experiences. The third characteristic is trust feelings. Trust feelings means accepting our gut feelings, accepting our negative feelings, accepting our ambitions, goals as they are. 
we also have the trust about our own decisions and that we are taking the right decisions. This is another characteristic of fully functioning individual. Creativity is another characteristic of a fully functioning individual. People with fully functioning trait will claim that they are able to take creative, novel and riskier decisions. They are able to take even the negative situations as a challenging way. Rogers claims that fully functioning individuals can be called as high achievers in the society. They can balance, they can take risky decisions and they accept the reality as it is without repenting about the past experiences or brooding over the negative experiences. These concepts can also be used in providing a treatment to the clients. That is, it can be used as a therapy. Whatever concepts he has explained, those concepts he says will be beneficial in treating the client who comes with the psychological disorders or psychological problems. He feels if the core conditions are provided by the therapist like unconditional positive regard, genuineness, empathy and disclosure by the therapist, definitely the client will be able to handle the situations and deal with the life in a more effective manner. The basic premise of this Paul Rogers therapy known as person centered therapy or client centered therapy is the client is aware of his own situations, the client is aware of his own problems and he is also capable of handling his situations but only thing is he needs some guidance, he needs a facilitating atmosphere which can be provided by the therapist. So according to Rogers people who follow the humanistic approach can facilitate a better change in the personality of an individual either within the therapy or outside the therapy if we can follow these assumptions. However, there are certain limitations for this perspective that is humanistic perspective. Critics claimed the assumptions or the perspective is too optimistic about the human side of an individual. They have completely ignored the other side that is the negative side or evil side of the individual. The second criticism is it is too subjective that is certain concepts like self-actualization they are very vague they cannot be tested upon and some claimed probably these are personal ideals and uh, values of Abraham Maslow and Carl Rogers rather than the actual uh, tested concepts. However, despite these limitations we can say the present counseling approaches or the counseling therapies or treatments based on the humanistic perspective developed by Rogers. So we cannot ignore the positive side of the humanistic perspective. We can say that humanistic approach itself will not be sufficient to bring about the change in the individual but definitely it helps us to facilitate growth and change in the behavior of an individual.